Okay, got an example here, a function, and they ask us to find the intervals where this function is concave up and the intervals where it's concave down. Now, of course, we could graph this function and probably kind of glean some of that from the graph, but we want to find it using pen and paper methods. So this one's going to be a little difficult because in order to do this in general, we have to know something about the second derivative. Okay, you remember that a function's concave up whenever the second derivative is positive. It's concave down whenever the second derivative is negative. So, you know, finding out where a function's concave up and concave down is a lot like finding where a function is increasing and decreasing, except all of that analysis goes to the second derivative, okay? So the first thing we have to do is compute the second derivative of this function, okay? Now, there's no easy way to do that. We just have to get the first derivative and then take the derivative of the first derivative. So, uh, for this one, we're going to use the quotient rule. And remember, the quotient rule says take the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which is 2x, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, which is also 2x, all over the denominator squared. Okay. So the first derivative of this function, well, let's see, I think we're going to get, let's see, 2x cubed minus 8x, and then it'll be minus 2x cubed minus another 8x over x squared minus 4 squared. Well, some things cancel here. The first derivative is negative 16x over x squared minus 4 squared. Okay, now that's only the first derivative. We still need the second derivative in order to find out something about concavity. Okay, now I could have, could have picked one where the function was a polynomial and we could get the second derivative really quick, but it's a good, good to do some of these tougher ones sometimes. Okay, so again, for the second derivative, we can use the product rule. Okay, so again, the product rule tells me take the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which is negative 16. Okay, oops, there's the denominator. Okay, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, and for that I have to use this generalized power rule. So, let's see, it's going to be 2 times x squared minus 4 to the power 1 times the derivative of x squared minus 4, which is 2x, and that's all over x squared minus 4. And now I have to square the old denominator, which is going to give us x squared minus 4 to the fourth power. Okay. Now, it's going to take a little bit because this is a pretty complicated second derivative, but I think we can go ahead and simplify it a little bit. What you'll notice is that we've got x squared minus 4 as factors in the numerator and as a factor in the denominator. So actually, I can factor 1x squared minus 4 out of each of these two terms I have in the numerator. Okay, so I'll take away 1 and cancel that with 1 in the denominator. Okay. So and I know it's you know, kind of a bigger thing, but what we'll end up with here is negative 16x squared uh, plus 64. Okay, so I'm multiplying this inside. And then what am I going to have left? I'm going to have plus 16x times uh, 2 times 2x, so times 4x. Okay, let's see, did we get everything? I think so. Okay, so <coughs> that's all over x squared minus 4. Cubed. Okay, so let's let's see what we got here. So we've got 64x squared. No, let's see. You got 64 minus 16, so it's 48x squared plus 64. Okay, all over x squared minus 4 to the power 3. Okay. So, let's see, I think we're okay there. Okay, so this is our second derivative. Now, this tells us uh, where the function's concave up and concave down, or at least it will tell us that. Um, so the question becomes now, where is this positive and where is this negative? Okay, well, just like when we're determining where a function is, is increasing and decreasing, uh, concavity is similar. It can only change when the second derivative is equal to zero or undefined. Okay. So if you set the numerator equal to zero, we can figure out when this fraction is equal to zero. And it turns out 48x squared plus 64. If we set that equal to zero, remember if the numerator is zero, the whole second derivative will be zero. It turns out there's not going to be a solution here because if we move the 64 over to the other side, we get 
48x squared equals negative 64, or x squared equals negative 64 over 48. Of course, x squared can't be a negative number. So, so no critical numbers for the second derivative, if you want to call them that, uh, coming from the derivative, second derivative being 0. Okay? But it will be undefined if the denominator is over 0. Of course, if we set the denominator equal to 0, of course, we can set this one factor equal to 0. Okay? We get x equals 2 and negative 2. Okay? So they don't call these critical numbers, but these are like critical numbers for the second derivative. These are values of x where the second derivative is, in this case, undefined, or possibly equal to 0. Uh, we didn't find any there. But these are the, the only numbers where the second derivative can change from positive to negative. OK, so to finish this problem, it's been a little bit of work, but we, we now are ready to kind of look at those intervals. And what we see here, and go ahead and leave the second derivative here simplified. Okay. What we see is that there are two numbers where our second derivative could possibly change signs. 2 and negative 2. So from negative infinity to negative 2, the second derivative is either going to be positive or negative. From negative 2 to 2, it's either going to be positive or negative. Okay, just one or the other. And from 2 to infinity, it's going to be one or the other as well. Okay, so we need to test these three intervals, the, the three intervals separated by you know, those two uh, 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 points that made the second derivative 0 or undefined. So well, what do, we, what do we test here? Well, we need to test points in the second derivative that fall in each of these intervals. So here I might look and see what the second derivative is at negative 3. Okay. Here I'd probably see what the second derivative is at 0. 0 is a nice number in that interval. And over here I would test the second derivative at probably positive 3. Okay. Now, just to, to you know, skip a little bit of the, the work here and make things a little bit easier, um, you'll see that the second derivative, when x is negative 3, will be positive. You just put negative 3 in for x and crunch out this number. It's going to be something positive, it turns out. Uh, when we put 0 in for x, we can probably see that one. It's going to be 64 over negative 4 cubed. That's going to actually be a negative number. Okay. And then in this last interval again, <coughs> we should get a positive number out. So you know, I am kind of skipping something here. I, you know, I've kind of done these before, but um, you need to put these numbers into the second derivative to see what happens. Okay, so based on what we see there, we are prepared to answer the question of, of what the concavity is for this function. We know that on this interval, since the second derivative is positive, it has to be concave up. Okay. Then between these two points, negative 2 and positive 2, the function is concave down. So between x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2, the function curves down. And then from 2 to infinity, so this is concave down. I'm trying to abbreviate here, concave down. And then finally, again, it's concave up. Okay. So that's what they're really looking for. And of course, if you graph this function, it might be an interesting, somewhat complicated function. But you should see that from the graph then. On these three different intervals, the concavity is three different things. Concave up, then concave down, and then concave up.